Happy June and Happy Pride, celebrating pride in all of us. All this month, Richard Skipper celebrates those that are making a difference in the LGBTQ community. Never gossipy, the antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Thursday, everyone. Happy June, happy Pride, happy Super Moon tonight, happy Strawberry Moon, happy whatever it is that you're celebrating. Welcome to Richard Skipper Celebrates. For those of you who are here for the first time, my show is all about celebrating artists and their body of worth. What makes a great artist? How do they get from point A to point B and beyond? And I am so excited about today's guest. We have Jason Dotley on the show, and I'm a huge fan of his. As a matter of fact, I'm doing something next month that I very rarely do, and that is that I am taking a real, honest-to-God, uh, live vacation. I am disconnecting from everything I'm going to Provincetown. I'm going to go back to the post office cafe, and I'm going to be sitting there in the audience cheering this young man on. Jason, thank you for being here today. How are thank you? I'm great, and thank you for having me. I, to you guys watching, I'm sorry we had some technical difficulties before. I'm in a place with tricky Wi-Fi, but we got it figured out, and we are here to celebrate some fantastic. Now, you, out, you are out on Far Island right now, am I correct? Yes, this is my, my and, virgin uh, experience. Are you serious? Is this I've your never really? been. I've never been. This is it. Jason, I don't believe you. <laughs> I don't. You know what? I don't know how it happened either. I feel like I've been everywhere gay that there is to go, but I have never been here before. Well, let me ask you. I mean, since it's your first experience there, what are your thoughts already? My honest thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what today's show is about. Um, it's, it's incredibly white. Um, and it is incredibly overpriced. Okay. Um, I mean, I had, we had, I had four margaritas in small plastic cups, important in detail, small plastic cups, four <laughs> margaritas, and the worst nachos you've ever had, and it was $104 plus a tip. Are you kidding? Well, I have to say this, Jason. I mean, uh, your dear friend, both of us have a friend, uh, Seth, who does yeah. these great videos celebrating uh, uh, Fire Island. Um, this is not going to be the commercial for <laughs> <laughs> Well, here's the thing. It's just it. Everyone here knows it's the truth. But here's the other the, the other part of my assessment is that it is magical, it is spectacularly queer, it is um, it's beautiful. There you know, there's no cars, so everything's connected by boardwalks. There, you see deer every every day you're out walking. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I started off with with you know with a few negatives just because I was keeping things real. Um, but um, <laughs> but it it, it there greatly outweighed by the positives. And what you learn, you know, Seth has been coming here, uh, my boyfriend has been coming here for dec probably two decades. And so you learn that you have your food shipped over, you have liquor shipped over, so that you don't end up going out and spending $104 for bad nachos and margaritas. Um, Four small margaritas that together would not make one really great margarita. It was, the, the check came, it was funny because the check came and Seth and I are very modern. We, we split, we split all of our bills. We split the, we, we split everything. And so he's like, I'm going to go to the bathroom. And he handed me $40. He goes to the bathroom and the check comes and it's, like I said, $104 plus a tip, right? Which is 124 if you're going to tip decently. Mm -hmm. And so I paid the, I paid the difference and he comes back and he sees the check and he was like, my God, and he's like, he's like, did we, <laughs> did I, or did we forget? I was like, no, where the nachos were $42 because we added chicken. And um, and the drinks were, I guess, whatever the drinks were, a piece. But you know, I mean, that that aside, you, you do learn how to how to work around that. And some people can afford, you know, one hundred and four dollars for nachos and margaritas. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not one of those people that wants to to throw a hundred dollars down for, for margaritas and nachos. Well, are you staying in the Pines? Or are you staying uh, I'm in, in the, the Pines? 
Okay. But this was this was actually in the Grove. Actually, this was at this was in the Grove where this particular. You don't need to say where. <laughs> I, well, yeah. I know but where it is. <laughs> but it is like it is one of those things where I mean I go to because this is Seth's happy place, um, and my happy place is Ibiza. I go. I used to go to Ibiza almost every year for five years, and everything mm -hmm. is astronomically overpriced, just like this. You know where you're out and a bottle of water is $20 at a club and you're just like, what is going on? But you're also like halfway around the world on the Mediterranean Sea in this old world part of the country. Um, so that's just kind of how places work. I mean, we're on an island. It costs them a lot more money to get things here. And, um, and typically you end up having dinner at people's houses. You know, we go to a lot of private dinners and we cook. And so I, I say that jokingly and also because every person i knew in the world was like just be warned it's super expensive and mm -hmm. i my response was oh we have, a, we have a free place to stay and they're like no 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 we don't mean where you're staying we just mean what you're gonna you know consume um and how long you, will you be there? how long will you be there um a little over three weeks total wow wow and i'm i'm loving it it's it really is magical i um i was and then speaking of being a very white place i'm very political as people that follow me now um uh, they had a beautiful, we have a beautiful Juneteenth March on Juneteenth down the beach, which was really lovely. Um, and it was so much of the community was involved. Um, and by community, I mean the Fire Island community, not necessarily the black community, but just people of all races. Um, and the support, we, there was a, a march down the entire beach. They started, uh, one end started at Cherry Grove and one started at the, the Pines and we met in the middle. And it was really beautiful. And, um, and I'm actually in a, uh, uh, black and brown um, equality t-shirt now. I, uh, being from the South, being from Mississippi, having um, had a very unique perspective on race growing up, especially in that region, I, I, am, I am very loud and very proud uh, when it comes to, to discussing racial issues. And so I was very grateful that, I, that Seth's housemate actually organized the entire Juneteenth um, celebration here. And so it was very nice to be a part of something that is helping to bring more diversity to this beautiful place. You know, it's well, let me ask you a question. Lovely. Since, since you've taken us down this path, if you don't mind my going uh -oh. there. Uh, no, no, it's, it's quite all right. Um, you know, we are a marginalized community ourselves and mm -hmm. uh, there, you know, and I feel that especially with what we've gone through in the past year with the pandemic and everything, that a lot has bubbled to the forefront. Um, what are your thoughts on how um, the LGBTQ plus community is addressing racial equality, uh, inequality these days? Um. Oh my God, I, you know, you've asked somebody that unfortunately, I, I, I'm not always right, but I keep things as real as real well, to myself as I can. Well, this is all about you, and these are your opinions. Um, I find the LGBT community, a lot of the white LGBT community to be very racist. Um, you go on, you see profiles on any, any dating app that says whites only, no fems, no Asians, no Blacks. I see it all the time. And not, let me clarify something, because this is a very big point I also have to make. I don't believe that you're, who you're attracted to and not attracted to is equal to racism. Let me be clear with that. Um, mm -hmm. But I do find it's, I was talking to um, a friend of mine here who, this is ma it's an amazing new gay rag out in Fire Island in Provincetown called Fag Rag. It's the, one of the most queer publications I've ever seen. It's beautiful. And um, I was talking with uh, the creator of it about um, the feeling of in inclusivity that he as a black man feels when he's in Fire Island and how that is changing and evolving. Um, and myself, I've lived in Harlem. Uh, my current address in LA is Inglewood. Um, I have had a very different experience, I feel like, than a lot of other people. And it's, it has just been the way my life, the way my cookie has crumbled. Mm -hmm. um, I also feel like Sometimes we get so lost in our own fight, and that goes for almost any marginalized group, that we forget that we need to lock on and stand up for other minority groups. Um, and it goes both, it goes all directions. Um, mm -hmm. I do think, though, we're doing a lot better job. I do think that people are becoming more aware of the fact that, you know, we all have a struggle and that we will get much farther along if we, if we join hands and, you know, we, we, we help each other out. Um, 
I also, you know, I, I, I fully understand personally white privilege. I try to talk about a lot, talk about white privilege a lot, what it means, how you can use it to help deconstruct it, how you can use it to help. Um, and as a result of that, I lose white fans left and right all the time. And um, it's okay, the, the, the cost of that is fine by me. Um, but I mean, I think everything is getting better. This is the good news. I think that every aspect of it is getting better. Um, but I would be lying if I said I felt like there wasn't still a long way to go. A long way to go. Um, but hey, the progress is being made, and so I'd rather focus on I'd rather focus on where the progress is than you know than focus on 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 where it, it perhaps isn't um, because that doesn't really get you anywhere. No, you just triggered two questions for me. Uh, first. All right. Have you always uh, been an activist and uh, where does that activism come from? I mean, I would say always from the time I was about to tell, from the time I came out at 16, um, I started my high school's Gay Straight Alliance in 1998. Good for you. Um, I had my, I took place, I took part in my first march, uh, political march uh, in Tallahassee. It was over the pr protection of the, the, it, we were marching in Tallahassee, my 11th grade year of high school, for um, anti-gay discrimination to be part of the law. So you could not be discriminated against for being gay at school. Um, I wrote up, and this is really shameful, but I'm just, I mean, it's part of my history, right? I had a, a newspaper column in the seventh grade when I lived in Mississippi before I had my awakening and when I stopped being an echo chamber for parts of my family and it, the, it was in every issue I was the co-editor it was called in my opinion mm -hmm. and at that time I was oh my god this is like hard to even say my columns were so right-winged that my teachers were sending them into Rush Limbaugh trying to get him to acknowledge me <laughs> are you serious I'm dead serious listen I'm just keeping things real I was because wow. I wasn't because I, I've always had this feeling of wanting to have a voice and to make a difference, right? But at that age in my life, I wasn't well, excuse thinking me on for, my own. Excuse me for interrupting, but the voice that you had at that point, was it a voice that was genuine to you or was no. it a voice that you wanted to resonate with your parents? It was an, I was an echo chamber for what I was hearing. Now, not from my mother. My mom and dad were divorced. Um, my mother had a very different, she was raised me very differently, but my dad's, a few relatives who I was closest to growing up mm -hmm. were very loud, very opinionated, very far right wing, very Republican, very anti-abortion, very anti-gay. I mean, you name it, typical far right, right? And so I was, at that point, I was serving as like an echo chamber. My columns were basically me spouting off all of the things I would hear, you know, while visiting my dad mm -hmm. and not from my dad, I must also be specific, from his relatives. And then um, it was 10th grade and I was on the debate team. The issue was abortion. Um, I had to prepare both sides of the argument as you do on a debate team. And I remember I was in the garage with my mom and I was, my real belief at that time was I was very anti-abortion. I was that, you know, you don't blame the, the child. But if you're raped, you don't punish the baby for the crimes of the father, all that nonsense that we all know. That was how I thought I felt. And my mom looked at me and she said, Jason, I need to tell you something because you're really hurting my feelings. And I was like, what is that? She said, when you were about five, I was in between dating Hal, her boyfriend, and, uh, and dating this other guy that I knew. She said, and I found out I was pregnant. She said, and I, A, I wasn't sure which one was the father. She goes, but what I was certain of was that I did not want another child. You were all I wanted, you were all I could handle, and I had an abortion. She goes, so when you sit here and you talk to me like this about this, I want you to know how hurtful it is to me to hear you say these things. And that was literally the moment where all of my beliefs, my, well, my beliefs began to be broken down. When mm -hmm. I all of a sudden started to think for myself as opposed to just echoing, you know, the loud voices that I heard. And let me tell you, it was quick. It wasn't like it took a year or two. It was like a lightning bolt hit me and probably within eight months of that we had moved i had started my gay straight alliance i was you know i was just as loud and just as proud but i was on the other side of the spectrum and it wasn't because i was echoing my mom my mom was not very political 
it was because I finally started to form my own opinions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would say I've always been this way. And, um, and I also feel like if you find yourself in a position where you have a little extra light on you or a microphone that's a little bit louder than everybody else's, that you have an obligation to use that for change, an obligation. And, um, and I take that very seriously. You know, mm -hmm. I, if it means I say something that people don't like, but it's what I think needs to be said, I feel an obligation to say it. I feel an obligation to stand up for what I believe in. Um, and um, I feel like if you don't, if you have that, that extra voice, that extra light, and you don't use it to affect change, then essentially you're just basically living a life in vain for yourself. And, mm -hmm. and that's not something I'm interested in. I love all of the other attention. I love like the silly nonsensical, like, you know, I, that's fun. Don't get me wrong. But what is the purpose of it? What is the purpose? And so um, I try to live a, a pretty purpose driven life. And so I will be the first one to march with you, the first one to stand up and say, you know, this isn't right. You know, this isn't. The, and I'm not always right either. You know, my own opinions on things evolve as I get older. My core beliefs haven't changed much in the last 15 or 20 years. But, you know. As mm -hmm. you learn and you grow and you experience things, sometimes you slide a little bit this way or something happens that opens your eyes and you slide a little bit that way. But I've pretty much been stuck to the, the far left for the majority of my, uh, my life since probably, let's say, safely since 17. So 23 years of being. Uh, and of course, my ex-husband, Del Shores, we, we, we shared that passion together. We both mm -hmm. very active, speaking at rallies and and um, and we kind of fed each other. We, we sort of, you know, we encouraged each other and we both felt that same sense of, of obligation to, to say something meaningful, you know, uh, to do something worthwhile with the attention that you have. Have fun with it too, but, you know. Absolutely. Make Absolutely. a difference. And make do you difference. think that you would ever run for political office? I thought, oh, it's funny. Um, after Trump won, I can seriously considered it. I lived in Florida. I had uh, volunteered for Hillary's campaign um, in a very Republican area, making phone calls day in, day out, day in and day out. Um, and um, after Trump won, I thought to myself, okay, well, what, how, how, do I, how do I now make a difference? You know, and my first thought was, well, maybe you should run for office. And then I thought, well, you know, you've, You've done some things in your past, like you've got some racy music videos. There's, there's a dick pic of you floating out there. There's no way that you know, you're electable. And then of course, well, the, no, Trump the, the, gets elected. The, the difference between you and others that have run is that it's out there for all to see, and it's not hidden. For them, it may be hidden. <laughs> right. And then I, as I got into, I, I got pretty knee deep into the process of, mm -hmm. um, of. I mean, I really was like hardcore all about it for about a month. And then I just decided, you know what, this is sort of a, a reflexive response to what happened. And I do not want to live my life in politics. I don't want to have to go and be a politician uh, for whatever that means. Um, I am truly an artist. I love to, you know, I want to be able to be expressive. You know, I don't want to think about, is this going to cost me a vote or... Is this going to, you know, it, it, it wasn't right. It was not organic for me. But my, ref, my, my first reflex to Trump winning was I need to get, I need to be a part of this to help make a difference. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that really was not my calling. Um, I'd rather help support people that I like. And um, because I, I don't want to, I, I love what I do. I love to, I really love what I do. And and it wasn't something I was willing to sacrifice to, to actually be in the real political arena. I, I, I honestly, I really wouldn't want that job. I wouldn't want to be the president for all the money in the world. I think mm -hmm. it's just the worst job on the planet. You have half the world that wants you dead and half the world that wants to kiss your feet and, you know, never a moment of privacy and, um, constantly under scrutiny. And again, you I live this life where half of everybody always hates you essentially. 
And how well, I was going to say, you know, and Carol Channing once said to me, for every person who likes you, there are an equal number that don't. I want to ask you, um, because you are, and you, for your entire career, you have been an openly out, uh, proud gay man. Um, mm -hmm. Do you feel that there is any pressure on you on either side of the spectrum? On one side, that it is important and indicative of you to speak out. And on the other side, there are many people. I mean, I'll go back to Larry Kramer, you know, uh, who was uh, very uh, vocal and out there, uh, really an in your face uh, man in the uh, 80s. Uh, and there were a lot of people in our community screaming, I wish he would shut up. And yet what he had to say was so important to so many people. And I think now in hindsight that people have a greater appreciation for him than they actually did when he was out there in the trenches. Do you feel um, you know, pulled in either direction? Not by anybody, by myself. I mean, I feel, I've been out for so long. Um, um, I always say, you know, I'm, I'm gayer than nine dicks sucking 10 dicks. Then I have no desire to ever, ever deny that or hide that. Um, and I grew, I drew the strength I have to be who I am from so many different people who came before me, not always even gay people. I mean, if you, mm -hmm. when you see my one man show, I talk a lot about how Madonna, when I was a 13 year old boy in Mississippi, feeling alone and didn't know what I was, how her work and Truth or Dare and the interviews that she gave back in the early 90s gave me the strength to be okay mm -hmm. with who I was and know who I was. And you know, you can go to Harvey Milk. I mean, there's example after example of people who, who have spoken out and, and made a huge difference. I, I feel an obligation just because I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not a scared of, of being that person. I'm not afraid of of people disliking me, they're gonna, people, you know, it's, I'm not afraid of, I mean, you know, um, I'm not afraid of failure. I'm not afraid of people t disliking me or, or talking behind my back. I'm not afraid of losing fans because, you know, things that are very important to me don't align with their political beliefs. And I feel like I'm kind of this, the right person to just, you know, I, it, it's, it's just me being me. I don't feel an obligation, though, to um, cater to or to create work for the gay community, which is different. But I do mm -hmm. feel an obligation to be out loud and proud. And, um, and I feel like I would be really crapping on all of the people that allowed me to get where I am if I didn't. It's like, I don't know if you remember when Sean Hayes was on Will and & Grace and yes. he, he wouldn't come out. And he said that he did not owe anybody his coming out. And we were trying to fight the right to get married. And his husband had just remixed my record. And I knew he was married. And, and I remember thinking, all right, do you owe, owe anybody anything? Maybe you don't owe people something. But you know what? Bet you do. Like, you have a career playing mm -hmm. a gay man on TV and all these gay people and gay kids and straight people who love the character of Jack, maybe you don't owe it to anybody, but in the same breath, yes, mm -hmm. yes, you do. Like, mm -hmm. how do you not feel, how do you not sense that you have an obligation? But I don't, uh, I, you know, he's since come around and, and has been wonderful, but I don't know. I just, I say what I feel like I need to when I need to and hope I'm not, <laughs> putting my foot in my mouth too often. No, but where does this confidence come from with you? Because you're very confident in who you are and what you're all about. Where does that come from? Good question, actually. Um, well, I get asked this a lot because some people don't, some people are sometimes just like, I can't believe like you. When I say, I don't care what people think about me, I don't mean that, I, that in 100% capacity. I think we all innately would like people to like us. We all mm -hmm. want, mm -hmm. you know, we all, I mean, I do care what people think, right? I'm not, I'm not like immune to that. But the difference is that I'm, I find the confidence because I, I care about what the people, what my friends and my family think. I care what my 
boyfriends, close friends, and his family think. But once you get outside of that and you get into the world of strangers, I really don't care because I feel like as long as you're doing a few things, as long as you're being honest, you're being kind, you're being generous, and you have the right intentions, that's all you can concern mm -hmm, yourself with. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing those things and you're still having people have bad opinions of you, what else are you going to do? So I don't necessarily know where that confidence comes in. I, some of it has to do probably with the fact that I was married to somebody who was very supportive, thought the same way I did, was very supportive of how I, how I am. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a rebel rouser. I, I will... You know, I will stir stir the pot if the pot needs stirring. Um, and um, at the end of the day, you know, you have to be, I, I want to go to sleep at night knowing that I've done the right thing, mm -hmm. that I've, I've stood up for what I should stand up for, that I haven't watered myself down so that someone who can't swallow me can swallow me, and, um, and to be a good person. And I think the, conf the confidence probably comes from the fact that I know my intentions. Mm -hmm. You know, like I know that my intentions are pure and that, and I have probably, I probably have just confidence in my intentions. Mm -hmm. I probably don't have the confidence in the way you're talking about. It's just probably knowing that I know that I'm working from my heart and I'm trying to do the right thing makes me able to do what I need to do and not be concerned about the peanut gallery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm also 40. And I've had to deal with the peanut gallery for a very long time. And every year. <laughs> I have 20 years on you. <laughs> well, then I'm most sure you can relate to every yeah. year. They get easier and easier to be like, eh. mm -hmm. you know, like I'm, I'm really not concerned about what, and you know, somebody, you know, writes you something horrible on Instagram and has something horrible to say. It's like, I don't know you. I don't know who you are. You know, I don't like, well, I'm not going to let you, this strange person that I don't know, type something in on this this app and affect my day. But at the same time, um, you know, I'm not, I don't want to, I don't want to look at you and, and, the, and the viewers and say that I, I don't care because I mean, I would be lying. I mean, I, we all care. I feel like everybody cares, you know, it's just, you have to have a limit to it. You have to have a place where you draw the line. And I draw the line once you get outside that circle of my immediate the people in my immediate life, once you get outside of that, like have a field day. I can't mm -hmm. please you anyway. I can't well, please I'm everybody. Gonna, I'm going to go back to something you just said. Um, you, uh, Because all of us, if you are in the spotlight, if you are in the public eye, there are haters out there. Uh, they have nothing better to do with their time. And as you get older, it does become a little e easier. I love the snooze button. I love uh, the... Uh, <laughs> the block button, all those things. I don't even engage. I just hit it and I move on. Um, but it wasn't always that way, at least for me. Yeah. Um, the first time that you started e experiencing that kind of vitriol from people that you don't know, um, for those who are watching who may be experiencing the same thing, how did you get through that? Let me think back to what that was. <laughs> um. You know, um, I, I this is gonna. I, I'm, I feel like I'm just a walking gay cliche. I feel like, for those that don't know, I am probably the biggest Madonna fan on the planet, and I think I really learned. I, I watched and learned her, and I watched her endure. You know, the world beating her up. I mean, to this day, she can do. Yes. She can't even adopt a kid and not be called you know racist or by i mean um and she always forges ahead even if it's ridiculous she's always going to do her i gained a lot of strength from that um and then i think also i got lucky in the sense that when i first got put into the forefront and i first was in the public eye it preceded most of social media there was myspace and so in order to write something bad about me, it had to actually be in print, which just didn't happen very often. I wasn't at that level where I was, you know, where a, a, a publication was going to drag me down. It would be word of mouth or hearing something. And then by the time social media came around, which is when I feel like people became keyboard warriors and, you know, mm -hmm. are going to write you and tell you how horrible you are and, 
you know, this, that, and the other. Do you get do you find you get it mostly privately or is it put out in a public forum? Oh, it's both. And you know what? When it's really great, when they're really clever, I usually screenshot it and post it everywhere. <laughs> you know, I I love that. That's um, great. Um uh, but for instance, um, you know, Seth on the other hand, um, is very new to having a lot of uh, of strangers um, have comments about him, and he's come to me really upset a few times. Like, there's been things that have been posted, you know, and um, he's like, "How do you just, how do you just not let this bother you?" And I said, "Well, there are a few times, a few days where I'm not at my at a hundred percent, where I don't love it." And I said, "But how many times have you? How many times in your life have you taken the time to create?" a brand new Instagram account or a brand new YouTube account just so that you could write something nasty about somebody's video. Because I've never done it. So if you can take the time to turn all that into a compliment, if you can take the time to think, wow, my God, you just spent like 15 or 20 minutes of your day getting all this shit together so you could anonymously trash me. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a compliment, in my opinion, because I'm not doing it for anybody. And I just like a lot of shit, you know? Well, so, my advice to both of you is <laughs> don't engage. <laughs> Just don't engage. Yeah, I really, um, you know, I, I try that's not what they to. Feed on. They, that's and what I, they feed on. I tend to leave up negative stuff and let fans and friends <laughs> go to town with it. Um, the only thing I ever take down is if the person uses a few words that I don't like on my social media um, that vary, but like the F, you know, I don't like it. it they're calling me a, a fag or if there's, if there's a certain level of hate that I just don't want lingering on my, and anything attached to my name. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise I just leave it up, you know, and because A, I don't want them to, to have to think that they have the, the power over me enough that I'm going to take down what they have to say. And occasionally I'll, if it's something that's really clever, really, really clever, like clever hate, I will sometimes respond and be like, ah, thank you. I needed that laugh this morning. But I also like, I don't read, like if, if an article comes out about me on Queerty or something, I don't read the comments. I've learned that lesson a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Like you don't need to scroll past the article ever. <laughs> um, and, uh, and also I, I think you said, you, you hit on this a minute ago, but I tell this in acting classes. I tell this to my friends who are, you know, who are artists. Anything that has a strong positive effect on people will have a polarizingly negative effect on some. Exactly. Amen. So if you want to do something that some people just love, I mean, I always say there are people out there that hate Beyonce. I mean, like, what more, what more do you need to know to let go of the hate haters, <laughs> right? Like, exactly. There are people that hate Judy Garland and Barbara Streisand and these people that are you know, God forbid. <laughs> it's like, so if there can be legions of people who think that Beyonce can't sing and can't dance and is overrated and is a product of, of a machine, which is, I mean, I, the polar opposite of how I feel, then of course there are people out there that think, you know, that I suck and that the shit that I do stinks because there's an army of people that think that, you know, everybody sucks. Um, mm -hmm. And oftentimes just being happy is enough to get someone to hate you. Also, sometimes the success that you have reminds people of the things they haven't accomplished. They and they have. take that out on you. Um, and But I find that most often when you get somebody who's being especially vicious and like a, it's usually somebody that you didn't sleep with. It's somebody, it's somebody that you or actually- Or someone that you did sleep with and they want to get back at you. <laughs> There's usually a there's usually a little bit of a personal connection there, for there right. to be that much intensity. Um, and uh, I remember somebody wrote something really awful on one of Seth's posts, and he's gotten a lot better at this, by the way. Um, and um, and I was like immediately, I was like doing all my like my spy MacGyver work, and I was on Instagram, and I was like searching through and like backtrack, and I found exactly who the person was, and I wow. let's let's just say I wrote the person a um. <laughs> a fan letter. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes, okay. that's exactly. I wrote her a fan letter. And within about 10 minutes, all of her comments were deleted off of Seth's Instagram. All of them. And um, do you, um, But do you have any idea where that was coming from for her? Um, 
Well, he was a, he was really bothered by it because he's not like me. He is not a rebel rouser. I make him very nervous. Um, and he's and, also, let's face it, very new to the business. All yes. things considered. And the and, well, yeah, and to be in front of people. And so he wrote this person. It was just like, hey, you know, I don't understand. Like, why are you, you know, why are you doing this? And the person wrote back something like, you don't need to know, but I'll forever hate you for what you did and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, no, no, please. Like, like, okay, I, like, like what did I, like, what did I do? Give me a chance to apologize mm -hmm. or to have a dialogue with you. But she was really trying to like, and I said, you know what? I said, you're gonna have to just let it go. Like, if the person's not willing to tell you, if they're, if, if this is how they're gonna handle it in this shady all around the world, you know, way, then it's obviously, they're not mature enough to have a conversation with you. And you can't have a dialogue with everybody that hates you. And, um, and the more success you get and the more happy people see you, the more you're gonna get this. So learn to see it as a compliment. They're giving you a lot of their time and let it go. Focus on all the other, all those beautiful positive things that are, that are popping up before and after it. Give those people your time and your love. Um, but he also knows I'm, I'm like a pit bull. I mean, that's the one thing that all my friends know. I, you can say what you want about me. I can, but you just, you don't come from my, my friends and you just don't come from my, even my ex-husband, when, when we were divorced and things were not good between us, um, people would come up to me at events and they would think if they met me and they started off a conversation by having something bad to say about Dell, I guess they thought that would endear me to them. And even mm -hmm. when Dell and I were not on good terms, I would say, please don't please don't talk badly about my ex-husband. Like I love, we were married and I loved him for 10 years. Like I'm not here to have a conversation with you about trashing my ex-husband. And so um, I'm very much a pit bull for the people I care about. And, mm -hmm. um, but me, myself, I can just let things, I go, well, like water off a duck's back. It doesn't bother me, but you come for someone I care about and, for you. and That's problems, problems will arise. Well, I want to go back. Um, I, you know, I want to go. We've talked. We've covered a lot as far as our community is concerned, uh, and dealing with both the good and the bad and the ugly. Uh, but I want to ask you. All said and done, uh, we are. This is Pride Week. We are going into the final stretches of this great month of June. Uh, what exactly does Pride mean for you personally? You know, I think it's a time for us to celebrate each other. I think it's a time for us to reflect on our past. It's a time to, um, as much as we want to party and have parades and have marches, which is a huge part of our pride. I think it's a time to sit around and with your friends and tell stories, you know, to find a way to educate yourself. I remember I hosted, I was judging a national pageant. I can't think of the name of it, but it was a national gay pageant. And during the question round, I asked the contestants, I said, which person in our history, um, what, what, what person's work in our history do you think had the greatest impact on, on your life as a gay person? And of course, I'm, I'm aiming for you to talk about Harvey Milk or, you know, or, or Basquiat or, I mean, just somebody, right? And almost everybody was like, oh, my mom, because and I said, no, 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 no. Which person in, the, in our history as a gay community, mm -hmm. which historical figure do you think had the greatest influence on, on your life today? And mm -hmm. they knew no one. They, they, I, and then I would say, how about Harvey Milk? Who was Harvey Milk? This happened to be the same year the movie was out. So I was kind of like, my head was shaking. So I think it's a time to reflect upon the people that came before us. It's a time to put aside all of our, you know, our... Um, our inner, inner, um, inner community prejudices, you know, the uh, things I hate, the no fat, no fems, you know, all these things that we find on grinder profiles and embrace each other. It's a time to show each other love. It's a, but it's really a time I think to educate each other and ourselves to take time, if, even on your own, to learn more about, um, for instance, you know, I'm in Fire Island where they have tea, they have low tea at, six and mid middle tea at nine and high tea at 11 or something. And 
I said to someone just yesterday, I said, I, 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 I feel ignorant. I don't exactly know where this term, where the term T comes from. I had no mm -hmm. idea. And I'm a question asker. I will, if I don't know something, I'm going to ask you no matter good what, you. That's you good. know, um, and I got educated on the history of T. Um, and so I think it's a time for a lot of that. I think it's a time to, um, also celebrate being gay, you know, to embrace your, you know, who and what you are. Um, but I, I think it's also a time to take things a little more seriously. I think it's great to have the parties and the parades and, and that's all fantastic. It's all a part of it. But we, you know, it's like the NFL player that came out recently, whose name I cannot think of right now to say it, it, we can, this point can be made without his name. Um, I was reading today where people were saying, well, he had it easier, he's white, he's masculine, and blah, 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 blah. And I thought to myself, you know, this is a great educational moment here for us to look back at. Because first of all, he shouldn't, you, we shouldn't be taken away from what he's done because of, of the color of his skin or anything. I mean, he made a very brave step no matter what. Excuse me for interrupting, but I wanna uh, build on the point that you're making there. It's for that very reason that a lot of people don't come out because their very motives for coming out sometimes are questioned, uh, just as you're pointing out right now. And, uh, you know, I just want to point that out and, you know, continue with your point. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's a time to, you know, go back and, you know, remember the, uh, it, it, it's just important to know our history. I believe that in, ter in everything, it's like, you know, even, with Juneteenth that just happened. Um, I'm not obviously a member of, you know, of the black community. I'm as, I'm, I'm, I'm as, as, as white as a Lebanese Italian white boy can be. <laughs> but, but that community, we're all brothers and sisters here together, right? And so I loved being able to be a part of that celebration and to learn more and more and more about the history of that community. And I think it's important as gay people Mm -hmm. that we celebrate but that we also take time to because i got i had an um i'm i am not confrontational but i'm also not a doormat i'm somewhere in the middle and um i was at a dinner party in puerto vallarta a few months ago and there was this 21 year old guy there in this like kind of like dress thing i don't exactly know what it was but very very feminine right um, whatever that means. I'm scared to, scared to use those types of words these days. <laughs> and, um, and I was telling this story about when I met Sam Smith um, out dancing one night and how I had tweeted and said I had met him. And it was after Sam Smith came out as non-binary and wanted to be a they and a them, but I had forgotten. And in my tweet, I referred to Sam Smith as, as a he and how Twitter very quickly let me know that I had misgendered him and how I quickly retweeted out like an apology saying, whoa, whoa, I didn't, I mean, I'm a, the biggest Sam Smith fan in the world. That's why I'm making this tweet, you know, and I, this is new and I forgot. And yes, you know, I, I didn't meet him. I met them. Like I, I got it. And this kid said to me basically that I was transphobic and he went from zero to 100. And, um, and it hit me the wrong way and all the, at all the wrong times. And I said, you know, I said, the reason that you're able to, I said, how old are you? He said, 21. I said, the reason that you're able to at 21 walk around Puerto Vallarta and basically address um, and not get beaten up or be fearful to actually be accepted and embraced is because of people like myself who came before you, took the time to educate people. And all the many, many, many people that came way before me, they gave me the strength to, and I took this like hardcore time to educate him because he was saying that it was not anyone's job to, a, a, a trans person did not need to tell you what their pronoun was. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, how do you know? Like, am I supposed to just look at you and guess? Because if I come to you and I say he, but you're a them, that is your moment to say, oh, thank you. Ni nice to meet you. I actually identify as they and them. And he said, no, it's not their responsibility. I said, well, then are, are we wearing name tags? I said, I, I don't understand. If, if you're not willing to take a minute, you have to take every educational moment that you have and you have to claim it and you have to use it in order to educate people on what they don't know. 
And um, he left the dinner party. He got so bent out of shape at the dinner party. Um, but, it, you know, we do, we do need to know more about our past. I need to know. I mean, I'm, I know a lot about our history as, as gay people in this country, and they'd be very specific. Mm -hmm. um, but there is, I mean, for all that I know, there is three times more that I don't know. And so I think Pride is a nice time, a nice month to say, you know what, I'm going to have fun. We're going to love each other. We're going to let go of some of these things we hold on to um, during the rest of the year. But we're also going to pick up a book. You ever heard of those things and read a book about the gay history or maybe watch, you know, watch Angels in America or, you know, or it, it, it's there's a balance between having fun and then also learning a bit about your history and, and where we came from and how we got to where we are. And then you have a better idea of how to move forward. Well, th and thank you for that. I want to talk before we run out of time at the end of our show. Oh, yeah, sorry. I, can have you on, no, I can have you on for two hours. Um, but I want to talk about life on the gay list. Uh, that's the oh, name yeah, okay. of your show uh, that you're going to be performing, uh, as I said, at the post office cafe. Um, have you performed this particular show in other venues? And can you tell us a little bit about the evolution of this show and yes. you know what you've learned about yourself from this show? It's the show has had quite an evolution. I did this show for the first time five years ago. And, um, and it was all lighthearted and fluffy. And it was very much about the celebrities I had encountered and bad dates. It was very superficial. I toured like maybe 20 cities with it. Um, and then when I got to Puerto Vallarta, where I'm currently living, the guy that, well, this man, Tracy Parks, who owns a theater called Encanto, and I were talking, and the topic came up of uh, what I consider rebooting my one-man show. And I hadn't really considered it. And I thought, you know what? This is kind of perfect. I'm here as a theater that's just sitting empty. Um, I should do it. Well, I sat down to look at the material, and my life had changed so much in the past five years. Um, for those that don't, who are new to me, um, in the last five years, I took care of my mom until she died of cancer. I actually my, my, took That's care of my her. grandmother, actually, until she died of cancer. Then my mom. Um, just a lot, of, a, what, a lot of, uh, a lot of really serious, heavy life things <laughs> happened in my life. And I thought, you know what? I, my life on the gay list is not a, a superficial journey. My life on the gay list actually doesn't start where it used to start in my old show. My life on the gay list starts when I was first coming out in Mississippi. You know, my life being on the gay list precedes the idea of a celebrity gay list. It precedes, it's just about being gay, right? So my new one-man show, for those that are coming, please be advised, is truly theater. It is not hysterically funny wall-to-wall. -wall. You will not laugh throughout the whole show is not intended to be. There are some very funny moments. Um, you also um, most likely will cry times. Um, as the last review said, you will laugh, you will cry, you will leave completely, you will leave completely fascinated. And now that part, I don't know about, but um, my journey, it starts off basically from my life as being a, a sissy in Mississippi to coming out, to moving to Los Angeles, to my first record deal, to how I met my ex-husband, to my marriage, to how that changed my life, to my work as an actor, to how Sorted Lives completely changed my life. I talk about working with Rue McClanahan and Leslie Jordan and Delta Burke, and I don't trash my show. I'm sorry, you guys, I, I don't trash anyone in my show. The tea that you get is insight into what it is like to work with and be around these people. Um, I, I'm not interested in, you know, I'm not interested in, in trashing people and this is not what my show is about. Um, and it does I dive in. You for that. Well, thank you. I'm not saying I'll never do a show where I do that, but it's just <laughs> not really, it's just not really what I think the world needs right now. Right. You know, I, I don't, and it's also not what my soul needs right now. You know, it's just, it, it, it's just not, where I feel like we need more authenticity and more love and support and, and we need more vulnerability and we need, 
all the oh, Kathy Griffin's D list is fantastic. It's hysterical. I love it. I will watch it over and over again. It's just not what I feel like. I it's not where I'm at. And so my show is just not, it's just not, please don't come expecting me to spill bad tea on people because you'll leave disappointed. Um, <laughs> and then of course, um, taking care of my mom until she passed away is a big, is a, is a, is a part of my show. Um, and so my life on the gay list has become basically, um, I, it, I have more time in Puerto Vallarta than I do in Provincetown. My show is like 20 minutes shorter in P-Town, which is giving me so much anxiety. I can't even tell you. So I don't know what to cut. But um, it's truly a theatrical journey. Um, and it was a big gamble because I, I launched it in a, I launched the new version in Puerto Vallarta, which is a vacation city. Mm -hmm. And people were saying, oh my God, we just got out of COVID. You know, who wants to come see your show and then hear about cancer? And I said, well, you know what? I'm an artist and this is, this is the story I have to tell. And it will either fall on its face and everyone will hate it or it will be well received and it will carry on. And it turned out to be almost sold out every, every single weekend. And, um, and straight people were coming in droves because you do not have to be gay to understand, appreciate, or um, relate to my story at all, which, is, um, which surprised me. I didn't think about it until it started happening. And, um, and it's, it's, it's it's truly I feel like it's it's almost just belongs parked off Broadway for like a year in a very theatrical setting because when you go to Provincetown and Puerto Vallarta and you know and all over and you go to see these people's one man shows you are pretty much expecting like a laugh a minute or a mm -hmm. song a minute you know and you don't get that in my show um, but I I haven't found anybody yet that has. Uh, had a problem with that. And um, so, yeah, my, my show really is a theatrical journey. And it's, uh, it's every time I do it, it's gut wrenching for me. Every time I do it, it is incredibly cathartic. And, um, and I get to, um, I get to keep my mom's spirit mm -hmm. alive with me in the show, sure. which is really nice, because my mom was my best friend and my fiercest supporter. And so, um, uh, in fact, the last review I got in Puerto Vallarta, I was walking down the street reading this review. The critic came twice. She gave me two reviews. She loved it so much the first time, and she heard I'd made changes, and she came back again. And then she reviewed it again, which was completely unexpected. Who gets two reviews? And I'm walking, and I'm reading it, and she says something like, um, you get to hear these life-changing stories, life-changing encounters with celebrities like Del Shores and Delta Burke and Olivia Newton-John and Madonna and his mom, Jason's favorite star of all. And I literally just like. And what was your mom's name? It was Sherry. And so Sherry, a, yeah. we raise a cup to you. Ah, thank you. Yes. Thank you. I mean, I mean, I'd get these tears off my face, but it's. um. No, I think. Yeah, I, I it's, think uh, you know, and, um, and when this, I just signed on, I literally just yesterday signed on to do three more months of my show in high season in Puerto Vallarta. Oh, good and for then, you. Um, thank you. And then after that, my plan, if one can plan eight months in the future anymore, I don't know, is to hit the road in the States and to do it, um, do it in America. Uh, Provincetown right now is the only place I'm doing. And, um, and then I'm back. It was just too hard with COVID to book shows. And then I have another thing I do in Puerto Vallarta. I have a pool party I host every week which I'm very proud of because if I just may take one second, because mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I keep saying I'm 40, like it's like some like, like breaking <laughs> news, but you know, I got asked to host a party at the resort I was staying at called Casa Cupola, which I spent my first month at in, in Puerto Vallarta before I decided to move there. It's gay, it's clothing optional. And I was so far out of nightlife and out of the idea of hosting a party. And the owner who I love, Don, who really brought my, gave me some sanity, he said, can I convince you to host a party on Saturdays? And I was like, nope. And he was like, come on, it's just from three to seven. And I was like, oh, in the, you mean seven o'clock in the evening? I've done it. Oh, okay. I was like, I can, I can handle that. I can be in bed early. And I said, um, I said there, I'll do it under if, two things. One, I'm in charge of every, 
every song you hear, I, I'm hand selecting because I do not, I cannot listen to thump, 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 thump for four hours. I want to hear Whitney Houston and Madonna and Diana Ross. And I want to hear, also we have guests that, we have guests from 18 to 1800 years old. I mean, it's, you know, we have guests of all ages and I wanted it to be something that you, you had a, you were going to hear music that you loved, right? I said, and the second thing is, because it's a naked pool party, I said, we have to find a way of making it body positive. I said, so our, our social media has to show everyday people. I said, we have to find a way so that you can come to this party. And so our new tagline is Jason Dotley's Naked Pool Party, where every body is beautiful. And I make a very big point of, you know, I'll go on stage because it's to get the offer shots, to get people to take their bathing suits off. And I'll be holding a bowl of pasta and not, <laughs> listen, I, re I realize I'm lean, but I'm also 40. I'll be up and I'll like grab, you know, I'll do this. And, my, <laughs> and I'll say, listen, at my pool party, you can, you can shake your love handle. You can eat pasta, be naked. And guess what? And be fucking beautiful. So um, it has turned into a huge success, huge success because people, people actually come and they actually feel comfortable which is so unusual at anything gay, let's just be honest. And, um, and they come and they come back and they come back. And so I'm in the middle of finalizing um, a, a seven month deal to carry my party all the way through until I think the end of April. And I love it because that toxic narrative of you have to look a certain way to be beautiful in our community ran my life for like 15 years. And the moment that I was able to let that go and say, you know what, I'm, my body is mine. I, 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 my value is not determined by how my body looks. I will not allow you to decide what my value is by how my body looks. When I reached that moment, it became very important to me that the work that I did helped to reinforce that. And so I, um, I have busted my butt to create this event where and let me tell you, I get all shapes, all sizes, all races, and and um, I'm very, I'm, I'm actually really proud of it because it seems like such a you know silly thing, a naked pool party, and it is. Oh, but but mine has a terrible. mine has a hardcore point behind it, and um, yeah. and I'm really happy because I I had an eating disorder, I have body dysmorphia, and um, I wanted to do all I could to deconstruct that narrative in our community that you have to be of a certain age and look a certain way and you know and have a completely smooth botox forehead and nothing can move and you know and you can't ever have pasta or god forbid you have a bread i was out on a business dinner not even a date a business dinner with a dj who wanted my advice and i ordered a coca-cola like a regular coke because in mexico they're made with sugar and they are delicious mm -hmm. and i ordered a coca-cola the waiter walks away and this guy told me god he goes did you just order a coke and i went yeah he goes you know there's a lot of sugar in those right and i was like yeah that's like like literally that's why i ordered it and i love just it just to prepare yourself i'm gonna order a second one <laughs> like i'm not even done yet so uh you know i'm just trying to do my best to to uh be the best person i can and make better decisions in life as I go along and um, help help try to, you know, I'm not gonna change the world with my naked pool party, but I definitely get notes almost every weekend after my party from people who say, I don't feel comfortable at X, Y, or Z. You know, when I'm at, we, we love coming to your parties because we feel pretty there. And, um, and it really makes me feel good because I spent most of my life and the caps, I'm not, I'll, I'll shut up after this, the moment that it really hit home with me when I, when, I, when I started to let go of my own issues is when Olivia Newton-John, I first of all, I introduced her to YouTube, which I take huge credit for. She didn't know what it was, it was many years ago. And she was like, what? And I was like, oh, yeah, I saw you on Johnny Carson. She's like, how? And I was like, YouTube, there's this place. And anyway, so this is not that moment, but this is a bit afterwards. We were looking at, uh, she was looking at old pictures and she came across a picture of herself, I don't know, from the 70s or something. And she said, to me something to the effect of she said my god she says, i spent almost my entire life feeling so ugly i wish i could have seen myself as this beautiful girl that i as her i never saw myself like that wow 
And wow. it hit me. I got chills. It hit me like it changed my life because I thought, my God, like here you are never feeling pretty. Now you're, you know, you're almost 70 at this point and you're able to look back and say, God, I wish I could have seen myself how I see myself then now. And I didn't waste all those years hating how I looked, you know, and that was me for, you know, from 2020 to, you know, 36, you know, wow. and I was just like, this isn't going to be the rest of my life. Um, I had a friend say, you know, when you get to Fire Island, there's all this pressure to, you know, to look hot and there's all this pressure to, I said, I am not feeling any pressure from a bunch of boys on vacation in Cape Cod. I was like, I assure you, I was like, I am the least bit concerned, the least bit concerned about comparing my body to anybody else's. This is mine. I'm glad to have it. I'm glad it works for the most part. And, um, and no, I will not be feeling any kind of pressure. And I don't, I walk around and it's almost like I rebel against it so hard that like, I will have an extra slice of pizza. Even I'm not hungry just to be like, watch me eat this pizza. Um, but, uh, <laughs> well, when I get to Provincetown, I'm going to take you to Spiritus Pizza and I'm going to get you an extra Coke. Let's do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're speaking my language. Oh, my God. I am so thrilled. I want to tell everyone, first of all, uh, we were supposed to do this uh, about a week or so ago, and uh, Mercury was in retrograde. We're out of it now, <laughs> by the way, everyone. And we couldn't get on. But, Jason, God bless you, a testament to you. You said, let's pick another date and time, and we made this happen. So thank you for that. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. Uh, yes. We are at the end of our show. Um, I know I can speak for myself, and I'm sure I'm speaking for Jason when I say this. I don't take for granted that you could have been anywhere else for the past hour. And the fact that those of you who chose to spend it with us, it means a lot to me. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. If you enjoyed the show, if this is your first time at Richard Skipper Celebrates, and I'm all about celebrating artists and their body of worth, uh, there's enough negativity in the world, as Jason said earlier, uh, I'm not going to add to that. So I if appreciate you, that. If you had a great time today, please hit the subscribe button. Um, click on uh, the bell to get reminders uh, when we are going live with our next shows. Tomorrow night, I'm celebrating Carolyn Montgomery, an amazing talent. I'm very excited about that. Um, and hit the like button. Uh, leave a comment. Hit it. Show hit it. Friends. Subscribe. Hit subscribe. 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 And you know, and let's just keep the pride, the love. Pride is not just one month a year, and it's not just about the LGBTQ community. Everybody be proud of who you are. And uh, I always end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Uh, go to your Facebook friends list, and the sixth name that pops up, reach out with a phone call. Not an email message, not a text message, not a private inbox message, but a phone call to let that person know what they mean to you. As a dear friend of mine says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. But if you're going to be out in a boat, make sure that you bring a skipper along. <laughs> now, Jason, I'm going to actually leave the screen. I'm going to give you the final word. Oh. Anything that you want to say that yes. we talked about today that you want to build upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish that we had, or just any message that you want to put out to everyone who's watching now. And I can't wait to buy you that Coke and that slice of pizza uh, when we get can't to, wait either. <laughs> when we get to uh, Provincetown next month. I'll see you there. All right. Good night. All Thank right. you. Well, since he has, he has made the, 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 the grave mistake of leaving me alone here, I want to build on what he said really fast. Um, we live in a world that is driven by uh, scandal and negativity and, and what is the most salacious story. And um, in addition to what he said about reaching out to people, I believe every day that you must practice something called gratitude. And every single day I wake up and I, I make a list of five things I'm grateful for. I often do it on a Facebook Live with other people but I find that the greatest cure for almost everything in your life is gratitude. So if I can leave you with anything, I, like, like Richard said, I am very grateful that you gave an hour to us. I'm grateful that anybody cares about me at any point. But my advice to you is to always find yourself in a center and a place of gratitude. Be grateful. If you take a minute in any point of your day and you stop and you make a list of five things that you're grateful for, 
I guarantee you, you'll feel better. And if you don't, you can Facebook message me and tell me it didn't work. And I'll make you list five more until it does. So uh, yes, keep things positive, share the love, be a miracle worker in someone's life. And also don't forget, as I always say, find yourself some good light and love yourself. Peace out. I don't know how to end this though. There we go. Boom. Thank you.